Okay, uh, we're live now. So hello everyone. This is uh, MS Cube's final talk of the year. I'm Brayden Walker and I'm here to introduce our speaker, our last speaker of the year, uh, Jason Keller, a master's student in applied mathematics under Dr. Shevyakov. Uh, he's told me his interests primarily differential equations, but uh, we'll hear about some more of those as he begins. So Jason can take it right away. Uh, when he's ready to share a screen. Sure. Thanks for the intro, Braden. Um, yeah, so my name is Jason Keller. I'm a first year, first year master's student in applied mathematics. Um, make sure I'm sharing correct. Um, yeah, so what I'll be talking to you guys today about is um, what I've been working on. Um, kind of a few different areas of research have kind of put it all together. Um, and so that's some exact solutions to axial and helical symmetric MHD equilibria. Um, so it's a pretty big title, um, and it might be a little bit physics-y, but I'll try to focus on the mathematics. Um, so I apologize uh, if it's a little too physics-y. Um, yeah, so quick summary. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, plasma dynamics um, and what the MHD model is. Then I'll go into the axial potential reduction and solutions for the axial symmetries. Um, then I'll take a bit of a detour and talk about the MHD model and Euler fluid equations and how they're similar. And I'm going to look at three related spherical problems uh, between the MHD model and Euler's equations or Euler's equations. Um, and then uh, I'll talk about the helical potential reduction and some of the solutions. And then uh, lastly, some symmetry transforms um, for a new family of so solutions um, that are a bit more interesting. OK, um, so yeah, firstly, I guess um, if you don't know, like, and you, you're wondering what a plasma is here before, I, I'm going to actually make my screen full screen. There we go. Yeah. So what is a plasma, you might ask? Um, so a plasma is actually one of the four fundamental states of matter. Um, you can really think of it like a fluid, um, but there's a point when you add so much energy to a fluid, it becomes a gas. And if you keep adding more energy, uh, then the electrons get stripped away from the nucleus. And you just have this big soup of electrons and protons um, whizzing around. And when you have a charged particle moving around, it creates a magnetic force. And so these extra forcing terms show up um, in the fluid equations. Um, so that's essentially what it is. Um, yeah, and so the main model that I've been studying for um, plasma dynamics is the MHD system or magnetohydrodynamic system. And so it's an idealized model. So there's a lot of assumptions, um, assumptions that go into this model uh, to make it a lot simpler. Um, and so some of these assumptions are that the plasma is homogeneous and incompressible, and the plasma has um, perfect conductivity, which corresponds to, the, in fluid mechanics, there's these objects called Reynolds numbers, and they're the coefficients out front of um, Laplacian terms. So in equation 1b, there would also be some Laplacian terms corresponding to um, uh, viscous forces and then uh, something similar for the magnetic case. So if you have large magnetic and kinetic Reynolds numbers, we can just neglect these terms. Um, so these are some of the assumptions. And so I'll kind of talk through um, what each of these equations are. So the first equation is called the continuity equation. And essentially, um, I, I guess you can't just have a fluid or a material just vanishing and reappearing. So this uh, this keeps track of uh, the quantity being conserved. And then the second equation, the biggest one, um, if you look on the left-hand side, we have rho times the change in this velocity vector field with respect to time. And it, all of these equations are um, divided out by volume. So if you were to imagine just multiplying volume back in, we would have some mass times a change in velocity, which is just acceleration. So this is really mass times acceleration is equal to a bunch of forces, which is really just um, 
Newton's second law equals or sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. And so some of these forces uh, you would usually just see from um, normal fluid mechanics, but this J cross B term is um, kind of what makes uh, plasma dynamics a little interesting because there's also these electrodynamic forcing terms. So that's what J cross B is, and J is related to the magnetic field. It's just um, proportional to the curl of B, and and yeah, so um, B, so I guess uh, say rho is the density, V is the velocity vector field, um, and so the streamlines for that would be like the plasma streamlines, how the plasma's moving, and then J is the current electric current density, uh, B is the magnetic field, um, and then P is the pressure. Um, and then uh, the third equation really is related to the Lorentz force and how the force changes with how the fluid's changing and um, how the magnetic field is changing with that. And then we have um, two incompressible conditions. The first really is saying is always the case. You never have uh, magnetic monopoles, and that's what divergence B equals zero means. And then for divergence V equals zero, that's the incompressibility condition. So as the fluid moves along, it's um, it's not really changing. Uh, it, it can't be compressed and it can't be stretched, essentially, um, like a parcel of fluid. Um, yeah, so the whole idea is I'm looking for exact solutions to this system of equations, and it's a pretty complicated system. It's really non really nonlinear, um, and it's a coupled system of partial differential equations. So one of the first things we can do is we can look at the time independent case. Um, so we just set all the time dependence to zero, um, and so this is quite a bit more simple. And there's a bunch of um, useful things we can pull out of here. And one one interesting thing to notice about this um, before we move on is how similar B and V look. Like, imagine if you were to take um, B and V and just switch the places around, and everywhere you see a B, put in a V, and vice versa. The equations wouldn't change a whole terrible lot. Like they'd change a little bit, but um, not a whole lot. And so that's something to keep in mind. And we'll be coming back to these equations later on. Um, so this is still way too um, complicated to just dive in and try pulling exact physical solutions out of. Um, so the next thing we look at is we just we set the entire velocity um, vector field equal to zero. So we just say um, this plasma is not moving. It's just just sitting there in space or wherever. Um, and so that whole system just um, reduces to these two equations, 3a and 3b. And so the, the these are still pretty difficult, but um, it's definitely simplified a lot. Um, so one thing um, that's really important is if we look at 3b um, and we consider we consider surfaces of constant pressure, then the right hand of 3b will vanish and we'll just have curl B cross B is equal to zero. And that implies that B and the curl of B will be both tangent to these surfaces. And those surfaces, um, they're referred to as the magnetic surfaces. Um, and so a lot of the solutions I show is some of these interesting surfaces where you would have the magnetic field lines and the magnetic streamlines uh, tangent to, um, and the current density field lines. Yeah, and so for the rest of the presentation, I just set mu equal to one, um, so I don't have to keep track of units. Um, okay, and then we um, just with these parameterized equations, you can get the field lines out of. And I, I guess if anyone's familiar with whenever they show the aerodynamic um, aerodynamics of anything, and you see all the flow lines going past those are the field lines and there's something similar for the magnetic field lines like you have a vector field and then tangent to all the vectors you would get these field lines okay um let's move on so i i not only want to find solutions to those equations but i want to find some physically meaningful solutions so there's um two two sort of constraints that um i sum up here that i look for and you there's uh, 
you can have different constraints um, depending on what you're looking for, but these were the most general without sacrificing too many solutions. So the first one is um, there must be a finite am amount of magnetic energy. Well, it would be finite amount of total energy, um, but the total energy would refer to the kinetic energy, but because um, the velocity vector is zero, um, we don't really care about that. So just for the static equilibrium case, we want finite magnetic energy. And so um, the magnetic energy density is proportional to um, the magnetic field uh, dotted with itself. And so that's the density. So the integral over that, over all space, has to be less than infinity. Um, and it can't take off to infinity. And then also, uh, the pressure has to be well behaved. So essentially, there's two types of pressures that I look for. There's one that's more like in outer space, like you just have a plasma, um, some plasma stream shooting out of a black hole that's in a vacuum. And as soon as you get to the border of that black hole, um, or sorry, as soon as you get to the border of uh, this plasma inside, the pressure would go up. But as you get to the border, it has to be zero at the outside because it's in a vacuum. And the other case is uh, where you have a plasma that's confined to some kind of ambient medium. So it has to go to some constant value as it goes off. Okay, so those are the, the two physical conditions because essentially um, these two equations, three or the system of equations 3a and 3b has a whole lot of solutions, but um, not all of them are physical. So those are the extra constraints that we consider. Okay. Um, so, so, so like I said, um, this equation, these, the system is still too complicated to just dive in and start um, pulling solutions out of. So, the next thing we look at is actually symmetries um, to exploit. And so, naturally, there's uh, two, two symmetries that are pretty natural to use, and you see them in nature a lot with certain plasma configurations. Um, one is axial symmetry, and the other is helical. Um, and I, I should have showed a picture of axial symmetry. Um, but essentially, uh, one, one of the biggest industrial uses and um, by uh, studying plasma physics is really important is for, uh, I guess, thermonuclear fusion um, devices that uh, use superheated plasma to generate fusion. And in these devices, um, Essentially, it's a it's a tokamak device, which is a big torus looking object, um, and the the plasma is axial symmetric inside there. And so that's uh, I, I did note that with del del phi is equal to zero. So we're just considering that as you rotate it, um, there's no change. And then the other symmetry is helical, which is something more like a screw as you rotate it and lift it. Um, there's no change. So those are the two symmetries that we will be looking for. So essentially, this equation will be expanded out in um, first like uh, cylindrical coordinates, and then we'll use that axial symmetry, then we can get somewhere. And then next, uh, we'll go and expand it out in helical coordinates, and then um, use the helical invariance, and then we can get somewhere. So that's, that's the next direction that we'll be going. Um, so lastly, before Kind of jump right in. Um, I'll talk quickly about what I, I define as global solutions and then truncated solutions. So global solutions are we get the solution and it's, and it's fine everywhere. Um, it meets the physical constraints everywhere. So the whole space it has finite ma finite magnetic energy, um, and then also the pressure is well behaved. But then there's some other solutions that are also useful, but they're only useful if um, you really add a boundary to um, add, add a boundary to the plasma. So we have some solution, and it's only reasonable to consider something inside of a boundary. And so um, that boundary. So if this polygraphy U is the domain, then del U would be the boundary, um, and outside of which we just set the magnetic field and the pressure to zero. Um, and because we're introducing a new boundary. Um, where between, I guess, two different magnetic fields, you have to use the Maxwell's equations to uh, understand them. And there's a really useful boundary condition. And so this K here 
um, like uh, K right here is called the um, called the surface current density, and then this boundary that we create um, would be called the current sheet. And it it's also a it will be one of those surfaces that we talked about where B and curl B are both tangent to. Okay, so these are the two types of solutions. Um, yeah, so next I'm going to talk about. Um, I'll get into the potential reduction and then solutions. So the whole idea, so I'm going to be going through a quick derivation of a really important equation that I use for um, a bunch of solutions, and it's called the grad Shefernoff equation, or in fluid dynamics, it's called the Bragg-Hawthorne equation. And so essentially, we're going to use that symmetry, this axial symmetry, and then from there, it'll simplify things. Um, and then we can introduce a potential flux function and it simplifies things a whole lot more and we can uh, get out with something quite simple. So we start with um, these two equations right here, divergence B equals zero and curl B cross B. Oh, I thought I got rid of the muse, but it's equal to grad P. So now I expanded it out in Cartesian coordinates and then convert it to cylindrical coordinates with the transformation right here. And I, uh, Z doesn't really change with cylindrical coordinates. It's the same as Cartesian coordinates. Um, and you might be saying, well, why didn't I just use a, why don't I just use a orthonormal um, version of the curl? And then I don't have to do this nasty coordinate change. But the reason that I do it this way is for the helical case, the coordinate system isn't orthonormal. So this is kind of like a good practice for the more difficult case. But that other case is a lot more messy, and I'm not going to show it here but um so this is the way that i went through it is I just expand it out all in cartesian then um, convert the system to cylindrical coordinates and then the next thing to do because it's a vector field we have to get the right projection uh, for the new bases and then subbing everything back in we get the system of equations here uh, with 7a through to 7d um that's after we impose the axial invariance. So we say all the derivatives, um, well, essentially that all of the, um, essentially P and B, none of them have any phi dependence. There's still a phi component of the magnetic field, but um, we say that there's no phi dependence. One second. Okay. okay, so now this like system of equation seven is quite, quite a lot simpler. Um, and if we look at 7D, there's something um, pretty incredible that actually happens here. Um, looking at 7D, we see how uh, we have something with something with the derivative with respect to Z plus something else with the respect to R is equal to zero. Um, and I guess before I go any farther, um, the superscript is just the vector component. So we see B raised to the Z. It's not B raised to the Z, it's just the Z component of the B field. Um, so if we look at this last last equation, we have something uh, derivative with respect to Z and something derivative with respect to R, and those things add equal to zero. So what we can introduce is a flux function um, right here. Oh, oopsies. So the psi term, so when we say derivative of psi with respect to r is equal to that first component, and psi with respect to z is equal to the second component. And uh, the terms are kind of mis mixed match. So when we go and we sub this in, it does work out because, um, because of equality of mixed partials, because these are nice functions. Um, so then doing a bit of uh, manipulation, um, these things are substituted back into equation seven. And we get this equation right here. And now we have something uh, uh, derivative with respect to R times something with derivative with respect to Z minus something with respect to Z times the other thing with respect to R. And so this is known as a Poisson bracket. Um, and essentially what it means in this case when it vanishes is that there's a functional relationship between these two things. So that means that. Um, that R B phi, the phi component of B, that thing is equal to just any arbitrary function of this psi. 
And if you just wanted to check, you could just go and differentiate um, differentiate these and show by chain rule that this would be equal to zero only if it is functionally dependent. Um, yeah, and so again, doing a bit of another manipulation, we end up with another Poisson bracket between the pressure and psi. And so that, again, because it vanishes means that pressure is also a function of this um, flux function. And so to recap, we have uh, three components of the magnetic field. We have um, these things right here. And then we have that pressure is a function of psi. And so is this arbitrary function, which is the second component in B. When you plug all that back in, you end up with a single PDE, and this is known as the grad Shefrenov equation. And the whole idea is that yeah, this is just a single PDE. We went from a system of PDEs to just a single PDE. And um, it depends on two arbitrary functions, P and I. So the idea is you just pick a random function of psi that's like a, at least one time differentiable and you stick it in this thing and then you can solve it and it will satisfy through uh, through um, these relationships right here, it will satisfy uh, this system equation seven right here. Okay, um, so that's the derivation. And so yeah, this equation number eight, I use a lot in the next little bit. Um, so before I go, farther I want to talk quickly about um, some special functions I don't know if, if you guys have seen these or some have um, but yeah it's really important and a lot of the solutions I do end up getting are in terms of these special functions for a uh, linear ODE so one example is um, you have what's called the vessel ODE which is this one right here and this thing just has a general solution where these j and y's are these vessel functions um, with the parameter n. So there's going to be a lot of solutions that I'll be talking about that just have parameters, not just the argument, but also parameters. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's keep going. I guess one, one nice way to think about um, these solutions to homogeneous linear ordinary differential equations is that essentially they create a basis of solutions that spans the space of all the solutions to any initial value problem. So in this case, with the Bessel ODE. OK, um, so first family um, are the first solutions I'm going to talk about. So we choose i to be linear, right? We, we, choose, we choose the functions in a smart way that um, we can do something with the grad Shefrenov equation. So I'll go back to it. If, if we look at it, if we pick i to be linear and p to be quadratic, um, this thing becomes a linear uh, separable partial differential equation. And then we can do some pretty nice things with it and we can look for a separable solution. So yeah, so we take p to be quadratic and i to be linear, and then we can start looking for solutions where psi is equal to a function of r times a function of z. Um, and so there's two different families of solutions, and they correspond to two different pressure profiles. So the first family of solutions is the Whitaker functions. Um, and so that's the WM and the WW, and they have two parameters and then the argument. And so that linear combination of Whitaker functions is multiplied by linear sine and cosine. And these linear sines and cosines um, um, yeah, when you separate the PDE, but you, you could you could take sine and cosines or you could take exponentials, but these sine and cosines correspond more to something like a plasma jet where exponentials would be more for like a solar flare or something. Uh, so this is better for the model that I'm looking at. And then the second family, it's when we have positive pressure or there's a plus sign and you end up getting a related function, but it acts quite a bit different, and it's the Coulomb wave functions. Um, and anyone who's familiar with um, the Schrodinger equation, if you stick a Coulomb potential into the 1D Schrodinger equation, the, this is the um, basis of solutions that you end up getting. Um, so these are the two families of solutions. And then I can take any linear combination of these 
here at Fourier transform, um, and it's also going to be a solution. Um, so, so here are some of the level curves of psi. So um, maybe I'll show I'll show this one next. Okay, so here's the Whitaker functions. Okay, and so I go and I compute this for some delta, some q. Um, and now I look at the level curves of psi, and I might jump back a long way uh, to here. So remember how I said, um, if we look at lines of constant pressure, we'll have curl B cross B equals zero, and that means we'll have the surface where B and curl B are tangent to it. Well, we know P is a function of psi now. So for constant psi, P is also going to be constant. Um, and that means the right-hand side is also going to vanish. So just looking at um, P, uh, uh, constant uh, levels of P or psi, we'll end up getting these magnetic surfaces. Um, okay, so that's essentially what this is here. And if you want to think of the 3D surface, what you'd have to do, because it's actually symmetric, is rotate this object on the left around the Z axis, just kind of stick a pencil through it and rotate it around. Um, sorry, take, uh, stick a pencil through the Z axis here and then just push it around and you'd get a bunch of nested tori. Um, and then on the right here is just the magnetic energy density. And the thing with this, this is a truncated solution. This uh, Whitaker function doesn't behave nicely everywhere. So it's only reasonable inside of some domain. Um, so that's one solution. And then the Coulomb wave, wave functions. And I guess before I go any farther, if you see the pressure, you see how inside is the lowest. And then as it goes to the outside, that's the highest. So that's more for something inside of a ambient medium. But then in this case with the Coulomb wave functions, we get something that looks kind of similar, but the thing is the pressure is higher in the center. And again, these Coulomb wave functions actually are periodic. So um, they don't have finite magnetic energy unless you truncate it and only look at some region. So those are two solutions. And there's a really cool special case that happens with the Whitaker functions. If delta becomes an integer, and this whole solution becomes essentially a Gaussian multiplied by some polynomials. And since the Gaussian is going to kill all the polynomials at plus or minus infinity, um, it's a global solution in that case. And you can take a bunch of linear combinations. And, and there's a paper by a guy named Volga Belinsky, and um, he goes and he writes them as a really nice linear combination. And you can add a bunch of interesting uh, solutions together and get some really cool plots. Um, yeah, and so if we wrap those around uh, the z-axis, these are some of the images you see. On the left would be like one of the Bogolinsky solutions, and on the right, I think, is the Coulomb wave um, solution. So each of these surfaces would have the magnetic field lines and the streamlines, um, sorry, and the current lines like ripping around. Okay, so quickly I'm going to take a bit of a, um, I'm going to talk about something a little different, and that's the Euler fluid equations and how they're related to the MHD equations. So remember, this is the system of MHD equations, and it's an idealized model. We say it's homogeneous and compressible with the large kinetic and magnetic Reynolds numbers. Um, and then there's also the incompressible Euler equations. And so it's also homogeneous and incompressible. And then uh, it has a large kinetic realm number, which gets rid of a higher order Laplacian term. OK. And so something is really interesting about these two systems of PDEs. In the first one, when we set V equals 0, we end up with this system of equations right here, where we can uh, use that potential re reduction and get uh, and get the grad Shefrenov equation. And for the time independent uh, Euler equations, they look like this. And so essentially these two things are the same. And so you can use the grad Shefrenov equation for Euler, Euler equations to get some interesting solutions. Um, yeah, so. Um, and I guess in fluid dynamics, it's called the Bragg Hawthorne equation, not the Grad Shefrenov equation. Um, and I just talk about that right here. So 21 is the Grad Shefrenov equation, and then 22 is the Bragg Hawthorne equation. But essentially, these are like the same object. Um, 
So the next thing I did, uh, just, be, just with the Euler equations, is there's three really interesting related spherical problems. Um, so the first is ball lightning. So we now convert the grad Shefrinoff equation into spherical coordinates and look at something. And so this is a model for ball lightning. And I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's essentially a ball of lightning kind of floating. Um, that's like, uh, yeah, they've been recorded to happen. And um, sometimes it's it's pretty rare, but when a bolt of lightning goes off, it'll be, it'll create like stab, a stable plasma equilibrium where this ball will kind of just float there for a bit and then it'll disappear. Um, and so this is one of the models for it. And so when we choose pressure, we just choose it to be linear because that's the only way it can separate in spherical coordinates. Um, and I don't want to go too much into this. It's just a side note, but this is what the solution is in spherical coordinates. And these are what the level curves look like. Um, and the other problem now is in fluid dynamics. It's called Hill's Spherical Vortex. It's a pretty classic paper. Um, I, I don't know if you knew this, but like dolphins actually can make these spherical vortexes. They just do something weird with their tongue and push out water and it creates these um, creates these vortices. Um, and so again, it's sort of a boundary value problem. Um, with certain boundary conditions for the velocities. Um, and then this is what the solution is in spherical and um, cylindrical. And this is this is what it looks like. So you could essentially these, if you just take one of these um, four i, I mean it's a torr once it's wrapped around the z axis. Um, essentially, the fluid is like rowing itself through the water as it moves, and it's really interesting. And then the other spherical problem I looked at was a spherical vortex in a conducting fluid, which is similar to the all lightning model, except at the boundary, everything just goes to zero. Um, and so it's a bit of a similar solution. And the, these all are somewhat similar. Um, and I get contours that look like this. And I, I, sh I should have tried making a 3D surface for one of these, uh, but I forgot to get around to doing it. Um, so yeah, so those are some of the spherical problems. And now I'll talk about the helical reductions. Um, so in order to expand stuff how we need uh, helical coordinates. And so these are defined from cylindrical coordinates in the following way. Really are data inside. Um, and so this is the helical coordinate that we're going to say is invariant. So as you rotate and lift, um, if the thing is um, similar in that way, we just say that the change with respect to this variable is um, not there. So Doing that, um, you can do another potential reduction. Um, and you, again, get these Poisson brackets that show functional dependence for two arbitrary functions, um, i in this case, and again, p. Um, and so it's a little bit more complicated. But in the limit, as uh, this gamma goes to 0, e essentially, the, these hel helices just become just cylindrical coordinates. And you get back to the grad Shefrinoff equation. Okay. And so these are the magnetic field components uh, from I and cylindrical coordinates. Um, so one of the solutions that were recovered, if I choose I to be linear and P quadratic again, um, you can again use separation of variables and get some separated solutions. So again, there's two different families of solutions depending on the sign of the pressure. So, the, so now these, this is a pretty complicated function. This is the confluent Hoyne function. And it has one, two, three, four, five parameters. One of them, in my case, is fixed. The third one with negative two. Um, and these A, B, C, and D, um, I'll get to that in the next slide. They're related to all the variables in the, in the problem, or sorry, all the constants in the problem. And so, um, yeah, Hoyne function multiplied by a Gaussian um, and r to the power of b. And so that's a function of r multiplied by a function in terms of sine and cosines over here. OK. And, and there's the second family. And now that Gaussian is now a complex exponential Gaussian, um, 
And the really interesting thing, I guess, and you see in the Hoyne function, the first um, parameter is also imaginary because uh, A, B, C, and D are all real. Um, this function right here is actually purely real, which is really interesting. It wasn't the most obvious thing when I was playing around with these functions. Um, and again, we can look at any linear combination to get some interesting solutions. Um, yeah, so I'll show you some of these. Um, and I, so this is the confluent point function. It's pretty, pretty big thing, just with a lot of parameters. Um, and then A, B, C, and D are related to our problem um, in this case, in this way. Um, so if you were to plug in all these things for A, B, C, and D, we would recover something that looks like uh, equation 23 here when we substitute P and I in the corresponding way. So um, I'll do the solution last. So this is one solution I was looking at. Um, so I'm showing the pressure here. And so um, it's really interesting. And so imagine now taking this object, it's in the x, y plane. So now what we'd be doing is pulling it out of the page and rotating it. And that would be the 3D surface. And the speed that we would rotate depends on the value you pick for gamma. Um, and then on the right side here, I have the magnetic energy density. OK, um, so that's the first family. And again, look at the pressure. We see how we, if we move inside one of these things, um, that the pressure actually goes down. And then at the outside is where the pressure is the largest. Now, this is the second family of solutions right here. Um, oh, and I, I should mention this solution is a global solution. So I don't have to truncate it anywhere. Um, and then this last solution right here, um, I do have to truncate it at some point. Um, because it's also, it ends up being periodic. Um, this thing, in a sense, behaves like uh, sine and cosines in R to some extent. Um, so yeah, again, just imagine grabbing this thing, pulling it out of the page and rotating it. Um, and that's what the surfaces would look like that B and curl B are both tangent to. Um, so I, so that's what this is right here. So I, so you see these two inner pieces right here. I imagine only grabbing those two and pulling and twisting out and you get this thing right here. And so what I did to get the black lines on it is I, uh, because these black lines right here are just the magnetic field lines. And so um, essentially picking a point somewhere on the surface, I hit it with an ODE solver after parameterizing um, B. And then you just see, yeah, in fact, uh, the streamlines do just go around the surface like they're supposed to, they have to. Um, and I could have done the same with curl B. And I, I remember I did at one point and I ended up losing the picture. And it's really interesting. It's a lot more, a lot twistier looking and um, circles around a lot tighter. Okay, so that's the helical reduction. And so the last thing I'm going to talk about is uh, the symmetry transforms. So the whole idea, I guess, was to get to these solutions at all, we had to say the velocity was equal to zero. The, the velocity vector field was equal to zero. So essentially, the plasma is just sitting there, which um, isn't too useful. So the symmetry transform allows us to go backwards um, into the case when v is um, not equal to zero. Um, so remember how I said b and v kind of look similar in this uh, time independent MHD equations? What we can do is, and it's uh, really cool, and I guess shows the power of um, just linear combinations in certain cases, is by using a linear combination of B and V, or A and B and C and D are just some, some functions that are to be determined related to these equations. We can plug it in, and after regrouping, we end up getting the following um, new family of solutions. So, uh, sorry. Um, after substituting this in, we can regroup stuff to get it back to the same shape as the equation system of equation 36. Um, and we end up with this relationship right here, where A, B, and C are all just arbitrary functions that are constant on magnetic field lines and streamlines. 
uh, which just correspond to functions of that psi function we talked about. Um, and so in our case, the the whole reason this is really useful is in our case, we had V um, being equal to zero. And now using this transform, because B is not equal to zero, we can end up getting a velocity vector field that's not equal to zero. Um, and it changes the pressure. And it, it changes a lot of things. Like essentially, um, we won't have B and curl B um, tangent to these surfaces anymore because that's only in the static equilibrium case. But this thing transforms uh, static equilibrium solutions into solutions when G is not equal to zero. Um, so this simplifies a little bit when V is equal to zero. Um, it gives a simpler transformation. So we have, yeah, B1 uh, related to B through this one. And then we have V1 also related to B, where there's kind of two functions um, of freedom with one constraint. I didn't write it here, but um, we have B squared of psi minus C squared of psi is a constant value. And that's what C is, big C is. So now what we can do um, is use some of these uh, previous solutions that I, I found. And um, using this transformation, we can take them into uh, the cases when um, yeah, V is not equal to zero, which is really useful. So the first one, it has a different pressure. Um, so the pressure is transformed in this way. Um, I should have included the functions I used for um, these, because that, that was the most fun is really these functions are arbitrary. So you can just take them uh, in any way, as long as they're a function of psi. Um, they have to be differentiable enough um, and nice enough that it works out. Uh, but you really can get some really interesting looking shapes. Um, so on the left, this is the new pressure. And on the right, um, this is a new magnetic energy density. And the other plot I should have included is the kinetic energy density because we have V naught equal to zero. So rho times V squared over two would be the energy density. So that's one solution. So that was the axial case um, when I had to truncate the solution. And then um, this is a this is another one for that second. Uh, here I'll go back to it. Um, so this family of solutions right here, we again can use a transformation with some arbitrary functions in this manner right here, and get a new pressure, get a new velocity, or yeah, a new velocity that's not zero and a new magnetic field and uh, a new density. Um, so that's here, right here. Then, um, yeah, on the right is uh, the magnetic energy density. Um, and yeah, so that, that's pretty much everything I wanted to show. Um, were there any questions? I might have wrapped up a little quick. Um, so hopefully there's some interesting questions and some discussion. OK, uh, yeah, I'll be here to dictate questions to Jason if there's any in chat. Uh, if not, I think we have some of the regulars here, so you can come in the question queue and talk with Jason if you'd like yourself from the Discord. But thank you for uh, for taking the time to uh, speak to us. I know that uh, a lot of the uh, types are the messages in chat throughout the talk were just marvels at uh, at the notation you have. <laughs> and uh, yeah, same here. Uh, you don't have that level of notation in statistics. Uh, it's incredible to see. So uh, if there's any questions in chat, we can filter those to Jason. If not, we can thank him once more. So I'll just give a minute. Thanks for so. having me, Braden. Yeah, thank you for doing this. this. It's been the seventh, and I've been glad we've been able to do seven talks this semester. So thank you for being part of that, Jason. So I'll just give another minute or two for chat to come up. Sorry, they like my notation. Yeah. Well. Okay. <laughs> um, 
a lot of these, a, a lot of the pure math people are not uh, too uh, used to that level or I guess that much notation. That much. Yeah, there is a, there's a lot going on and I didn't want that to be the focus because there's just some really interesting stuff. Yeah. As well, not just big formulas and what. Mm. It's got some claps and chats and thank you from Sean. Let's see, it's another minute. <laughs> yeah, well, Robert clarified just uh, not not your notation in general, but just physics notation uh, is more of the uh, marvel. More of the marvel. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, it's I don't know. It's trying to find uh, trying to find the letters. Run out of letters pretty quick. And <laughs> yeah, Robert just said, uh, in math, we just use differential forms instead of differential forms. Yeah. I think I read that in the rules for this discord is something about not talking about differential forms or something like that. And not talking them to them to Robert. Uh, it's Robert. It's Robert. Bread and butter. <laughs> Uh, I don't, it doesn't look like there's going to be any questions in chat, but I will thank you again, Jason. Uh, just give you some physical claps to hear, even though it's just us two talking to each other for now. Uh, yeah. So, um, thank you again. And, uh, just for a uh, general information, oh, I can give this general information. If anyone's still watching and is watching within a week, uh, our general meeting is going to be next Wednesday. So if you're interested in getting involved next year, uh, tap in and uh, we'll hold our elections uh, next next Wednesday at five in my WebEx room. So you can uh, message us for details on that. So thank you, Jason. Uh, this has been a great talk and this is a wrap for the year. And it looks like my camera's out of focus, but whatever. Uh,